our trustees that we'll be having our monthly meeting this afternoon at 5.15. Uh, and, uh, but the deacons meeting is going to be postponed from today and the deacons meeting will be next Sunday at 4.30. So deacons, please keep that in mind and then trustees, our regular meeting will be this afternoon at 5.15. If you would please take your Bibles and go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 8. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 8. And I'm going to read a portion of Scripture, beginning in verse number 5. The Bible tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Just like that. No discussion. No asking questions. My servant is at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. He didn't even ask him to come help him. He just gave a word of information. Lord, My servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Now I want you to notice something with me this morning. I want you to pay close attention to the words of Christ in verse number 7. I will come and heal him. And I want you to notice the words of Christ in verse number 10. Verily I, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And in verse number 13, the words of Christ, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. There's the condition. There was always a condition to the healing. There was always a condition to the salvation. You can't be saved unless you believe. You cannot be healed unless you believe. 
You cannot have your prayers answered unless you believe. And we find here that the Lord is given a, a problem, a situation. We don't find this Roman centurion coming and falling down and screaming and crying and slobbering and begging. He just walks up to the Lord Jesus Christ and says, Lord, my servant, lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. You see how the simplicity of the statement that was made? You know, it, it's amazing sometimes. You might think that I'm about to be mean or say something wrong, but I don't mean to be. But, but if you ever listen sometimes to prayer requests, sometimes prayer requests are given as if God has no idea what's going on down here in this world. But we have to explain everything to Him. And, and, and here, here in a church service, we go down to the nth detail. The Lord knows what you have need of before you ever ask Him. I marvel at the statement of Christ. I will come and heal Him. I want us to bow our heads for a word of prayer and then I want to share a few things about this instance that happened this day in Capernaum. Our Father, in Jesus' name, thank You for Your Word and we ask Your blessings to be upon its reading. Holy Spirit, I pray for Your power and unction to be upon its preaching. Holy Spirit, I pray You'd speak to hearts today as only You can. There's a lot of hurting people here today. There's a lot of hurting people that would love to be here today, but aren't. They can't be. Lord, we pray for them. We pray on their behalf that your will be done, that you would touch them. We pray that your will be done in this service. In Jesus' name and for His sake, amen and amen. I will come and heal it. Just like that, I will come and heal it. I want us to consider for just a moment whose prayer this was. The words of the centurion were really a prayer. When you talk to the Lord, it's in prayer. This centurion comes along and he makes the statement, My servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and is grievously tormented. But what I want you to pay attention to first of all this morning is who was it making this prayer? Well, the Bible tells us it was a centurion. In the eyes of the Jews that were all around this, because the Bible makes reference of those that were following along with Jesus as He come into Capernaum, a port city along the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the Sea of Galilee, I'm sorry. And uh, they're following along. And to these Jews, this was a Roman. And being a Roman meant that he was a Gentile. And being a Gentile meant that he was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. And being an alien from the commonwealth of Israel made him a stranger from the covenants of promise. And being one that was a stranger from the covenants of promise meant that he was one that was without hope and without God in this world. That's whose prayer this was. Simply directed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some would say, well, what did he, what made him think that the Lord would listen to him. Perhaps the Jews may have thought, well, God, the Lord ain't going to listen to him. 
He ain't nothing but a Gentile heathen. And I'll let you in on a little secret. That's all you are. That's all I am. No different than a Gentile heathen. No different than this centurion. What right do we think we have for God to hear our prayer? Strangers of the covenants of promise. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. People without hope and without God in this world. That's how Paul explained it in Ephesians chapter 2. Well, you know, there's some verses that's been given unto us in the New Testament that surely does give me a lot of hope. Because you see, this prayer was an unselfish prayer. He asked nothing for himself. It was a prayer of faith. But you know, we learned something from this prayer about the Lord that just thrills my soul. To the Jews, this is nothing but an enemy, a heathen Gentile. And the Lord says, I will come and heal him. Just like that. I want you to know the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is rich unto all that call upon Him. So that means that the Lord Jesus was just as interested in the prayer of that centurion as He was in the prayer of any Jew that was there. Probably more so, as we'll find out, because of the great faith that He had. You see, there's the condition on getting your prayers answered. Getting your prayers answered has nothing to do with how pretty you pray or how long you pray. Or how loud you pray. You know what amazes me sometimes? I I go to these preachers' meetings, and boy, I hear these preachers, and man, they'll they'll start waxing bold in their prayers. And man, they they wind up screaming at God like he's deaf or something. God don't have any problem hearing. And has no problem knowing what you need. He was interested in hearing the prayer of this centurion because there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is... This overall is rich unto all them that call upon Him. Romans chapter 3, verse number 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in His sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There's that believing again, for there is no difference. John 6, 37. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I shall in no wise cast out. I just want you to know first thing this morning, I just want you to know who's doing the praying in this passage of Scripture. It's an old Gentile heathen that's no different than you and me. And the Lord Jesus was interested in hearing His prayer. And the Lord Jesus was interested in meeting His need, or more I say, the need of His servant. The centurion asked nothing for himself. Perhaps sometimes the reason our prayers aren't getting answered is because we really down deep in our soul don't believe Jesus can do it. We really don't believe down deep in our heart that He's able to meet that need, that He's able to hear our prayer and to answer our prayer. And so many of our situations in our life just seem so hopelessly impossible. You want to see see what God can do through someone praying for someone who's in an impossible situation? You want to see somebody who the doctors twice said, let's just unplug it, it's all over, he's never going to make it. Look, sitting right there in that gray shirt. Doctors twice called in the family, said, we're going to unplug him. He's never going to make it. He's too far. He'll never heal. He's sitting in the house of God this morning. Don't you ever think God can't answer your prayer? 
Don't you ever think God can't put something back together that's broken? God can put back together broken homes. God can put back together broken lives. God can put back together anything in your life that's broken this morning. But you've got to believe. You've got to believe. I want you to consider secondly for just a moment what exactly was this prayer? We've established who was doing it. It was one of us. It was one of our own. It was one of our Gentile race. Amen? But what was his prayer? How would we classify this little statement that he made here in verse number 6? Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Why, you should be able to see what kind of prayer that is. That's called intercessory prayer. He wasn't praying for himself. There was nothing wrong with him. He didn't have any issues going on in his life. But there was an issue going on in somebody's life that he cared very deeply for. There was an issue going on in somebody's life that he depended on. This was his servant. I'm glad the Bible didn't call him a slave. It said he was a servant. And I believe this Roman centurion depended upon him. If this centurion didn't have a heart for intercessory prayer and want to see something good happen to this man because he loved him and cared about him, why, he could have just let him die and got him another one. Amen? That would have been nothing for him. He was an officer in the Roman army. He could have got anybody he wanted. But he wanted that man. And so he went to the only place that he knew he could go to get some help for the one that he loved and cared about. So he went to Jesus. It was intercessory prayer. The Bible tells us that the Roman servant uh, in verse number 6 was grievously tormented. You know, every word in the Bible is there for a reason. There's no filler in the Bible. That tells us, being grievously tormented, that tells us that his condition was causing tremendous suffering. It means that his suffering was beyond terrible. Now that's definition right out of Strong's Concordance. His condition was beyond terrible. It would be considered excessive suffering. Perhaps he was suffering so bad that he could not pray for himself. Perhaps he could not lift up a prayer to heaven for himself. You've been that way, haven't you? I have. You get to where you, you can't even pray for yourself. You, the words just won't come. But you always have the Holy Spirit praying on your behalf. And isn't it wonderful to know that you have people here that'll be praying for you. That'll be lifting up your name to heaven and lifting up your request before heaven in intercessory prayer. Perhaps, perhaps he didn't even know anything of prayer. Perhaps he didn't know anything of the Lord. He's just laying there suffering and soon would be dying. But there was somebody an old heathen Gentile. One of us, praise God. And he lifted up a prayer on his behalf. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. When someone takes you into their confidence, when someone pulls you off to the side, when someone lifts up a prayer in a service, intercessory prayer means that we'll take that prayer seriously. And we'll lift up that request for that one that is in need. 
and you can see the results of it. And Mike Snyder is not the only one in this church who's been the recipient of a miracle by a, an answer to somebody's intercessory prayer on your behalf. But not only do we look at this centurion and see uh, what his prayer was and, and who was making this prayer, but I want you to notice also uh, the Savior's condescension. The Savior's condescension. Here he is, standing, ministering, walking along, whatever he was doing, and this old heathen Gentile lets out with the request on behalf of another and the Lord just says, I will come and heal him. Just like that. You say, can it really happen that fast? The Bible says it does. The Lord Jesus was fairer than all the children of men. He was higher than the kings of the earth. He was worshipped by all the angels of heaven. Yet in a single moment, he took the time to hear the request of one who was considered by all to be unworthy of a second of the Savior's time. And the Lord Jesus condescended to we of low estate. And he took the time to help a servant of a man who was in great need. The Bible tells us that in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he might by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. Just like that. And so we've seen, we've seen the faith of the centurion. But let me show you why this centurion's prayer was answered. I want you to notice with me back in verse number uh, verse number 8. After he gives Jesus the problem after the Lord commits to come and heal the servant, the centurion says in verse number 8, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. I want you to know Jesus healed that man's servant because that man believed in the power of God. He believed the Lord had the power to heal His servant. He didn't need the Lord to come over to the house and to lay hands on Him. He didn't need the Lord to pull out a script pad and write a prescription and go down to the drug store and get it filled and depend on the drugs. He said, Lord... He said, now I'm a Gentile, I'm a heathen, and, and, and I'm not worthy. My home is not worthy for someone like you to come into such a disgraced place as where I live. But he said, Lord, you don't need to come. Because, Lord, you already know who he is. You already know what's wrong with him. And Lord, you've got the power to heal him. All I need from you, Lord, is just to say the word. Lord, I believe in, in my heart. I believe in my heart that if you'll just say the word, you'll be healed. And I believe that with all of my heart. Did you pray that way? Do you really believe in your heart those, not just those small things in your life, but the big things in your life, the broken things in your life, the things in your life 
you have no control over. Do you really believe in your heart that all the Lord has to do is just give the word and that will be taken care of? I hope you do. Because that's the only way you're going to get your prayer answered. Jesus said that we could move mountains if our prayers had the doubt removed. If you've ever prayed a prayer and when you finished your prayer under your breath you thought, well, I hope he can do it. I don't know if he'll be able to do it, but I hope he will. You should have saved that breath for breathing. Because he's not going to answer that. This man, this heathen Gentile, that's our crowd. He believed that Jesus had the power to heal that servant. But not only did he have a belief and a faith in the power of God, but I want you to look in the next verse, he said. He says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And I say to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Now why did that man say that? Well, I tell you this, he wasn't trying to impress the Lord with his authority and his power or his position. But what he was saying that to the Lord Jesus for is not only did he believe that Jesus had the power to do that, but he also believed Jesus had the authority to do it. In other words, this heathen Gentile believed in the deity of Jesus Christ. He believed that Jesus Christ was God. That that Roman centurion, he hung around them Jews all the time. He heard them talking. He might have been standing around that day in John 9, 31 when when them Pharisees said, said, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. He probably knew the lingo of the Jews. We live down here in the Bible Belt. North Carolina, we live in the buckle of the Bible Belt. And everybody knows the lingo. Everybody knows the Christian lingo and know what to say and when to say it and how to say it to make everybody think you're all right and you're all right and you know God. And you don't know God no more than you know anybody else. You just know the lingo. This man, this man said, Lord, you've got the power to heal him, and I believe you can do it. He said, but not only that, he said, I know a thing or two about authority, and I've got a little bit. He said, but you've got a whole lot more than i got, and I believe that you have the authority and the deity to heal him. In other words, he was saying, Lord, there's nobody else can heal him except you. You know, if someone would have said to that centurion, well, I will come and attend to him. Well, those would have been the words of a friend. I'll come and help out and do what I can. Someone may have come along and said, well, I'll, uh, I'll come and I'll pray with him. Well, that, that'd be the words of my profession. That'd be the words of a pastor. I'll come and pray with you. Another may have said, well, I'll come and I'll give him the examination and uh, I'll see what's going on with him. Well, that would have been the words of a good doctor. But the words of the great physician had much more power and effect when he just simply said to this heathen Gentile, I will come and heal him. No questions asked. Just like that. This Roman centurion knew there was something about the power of Christ. He knew no visit was needed. He knew no physical touch was needed. He just needed the Word of God to promise that his man would be healed and he knew that he would be healed. And this this heathen did something in verse number 10. This heathen made Jesus marvel. The Bible says in verse 10, When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. 
He marveled. It means he held him in admiration for his faith's sake. And just like that, he would heal the servant. Lastly, I'd like you to consider the Savior's healing of this man as an emblem of salvation. The natural man is a fallen creature. You're a fallen creature. I'm a fallen creature. We're spiritually diseased. As a matter of fact, we're spiritually dead. And there's no health in us. You may be sitting here this morning and you think, well, I'm all right. I'm as good as the rest of them. Don't ever compare yourself with someone else and determine whether you're right with God. You're comparing yourself to the wrong standard. If you want to compare yourself to see how right you are with God, you compare it with this book right here. Let's see what the book says about our condition. In Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse number 4, Isaiah said, All sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. There's, there's where we are. There's our condition. We're as sick, we're as sick, we're as sick as the centurion servant ever was. But I want you to know that on down in that first chapter of Isaiah, the Lord says in verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. You see, nothing can elude Christ's skill or baffle His remedy that He has for your life. What's broken in your life this morning? What's broken in your life that you would love to come and talk to Jesus about today? He can meet that need just like that. But you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to trust Him and believe Him with your whole heart, not with just your head. The man I used to pastor told me one day, he said, Preacher, if you're going to pray for rain, you need to carry an umbrella with you. If you have something broken in your life that you desire Christ and you're going to trust Christ and believe Christ to heal, then you need to expect that outcome and not be shocked when it happens. But expect it. That's what this Roman did. He expected Christ to do that. You just say the word. Just say the word. That's all I need to hear from you. And I believe you'll heal him. And the Lord said to him in verse number 13, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so, it be, so be it done unto thee. And the servant, his servant, was healed. The selfsame hour. The moment that Christ gave the word, the healing. Do you believe that? Well, the Bible says Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to suffer, that by His stripes we could be healed. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to speak life to the spiritually dead. Your prayers can be heard this morning. as heathen Gentiles, strangers from the covenants of promise and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. 
Still, the King of Kings will hear our prayer because He heard that man's prayer. God can fix what's broken in your life this morning. Just like He fixed that broken soul. Let's bow our heads. I've given you the truth this morning. I've given you the Bible. I've done what God asked me to do. Now, the decision is yours. Father, in Jesus' name, if there be anyone here this morning who has a broken, something broken in their life, they would love for you to heal and to make whole again. The Bible says that you will. You said, I will come and heal him. Lord, they have to believe. They have to believe. Now, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to hearts this morning. I suspect you already have. And I pray the folk will just obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand our feet.